Hello everybody, welcome back to another Pandora Hearts discussion video. This time, I am going to be tearing apart volume number 18. Now, if you're new to this series, this video is nothing but spoilers, so read the volume before you watch the video. Secondly, I do not read ahead before I record these videos, so I have no idea what happens in volumes 19 and on. I'm just purely speculating if I say this is what I think. So let's get right into it because this volume finally starts to answer a bit about the origin of the B-Rabbit chain as well as Oz himself, and we find out that yes, in fact, they are one and the same. Now, it also answers something that was a, a bit problematic for me ever since we found out that Jack seemed to be sort of the driving force behind the events in Sablier, which was, I couldn't figure out how it worked that Glenn could order the Baskervilles to kill all those people and yet still not be the villain. That was sort of an issue for me. And, and I admit that now that I know the answer, I feel maybe a little bit silly for not seeing it, but I think that's because right from volume one, We've been pretty much indoctrinated with this idea that Glenn is a villain and that Glenn went to any kind of extreme level in order to take out the intention of the abyss. So it was kind of hard to wrap your head around the idea that he might order mass murder for a good reason. So let's get right into this because there's a ton to talk about. So we find out that yes, in fact, Oz began his existence as a stuffed bunny. Two stuffed bunnies, if we want to be really precise about this. And they both belonged to Lacey. And they were twins, essentially. And Lacey... I, I'm guessing Lacey bought two of the same for this express purpose. But her whole idea was she presented one to the core of the abyss, which was the sort of sentient yet formless... Uh, you know, center of the abyss, and she kept one for herself. And she basically was like, this is like a symbol of our friendship. And she did this when she was younger. And we already know from sort of earlier volumes that the abyss is able to imbue non-living items with a semblance of life, or is able to take a form of life and then change it. So we know this from, say, Cheshire Cat, because Cheshire was an honest-to-goodness kitten who became a more human-like chain. And we've seen that certain dolls in the intention of the Abyss's room also have become chains or have been imbued with a form of life. And so it's not really any kind of stretch that this stuffed bunny that sits and exists at the core of the Abyss, the very heart of the Abyss, would eventually become imbued with a form of consciousness. And because its twin existed in the real world, or in the non-abyss world, he was able to essentially travel between the two. But I'm guessing that because the stuffed bunny on the other side, in the real world, had no consciousness of its own, that was why he was able to have a singular consciousness that was able to exist between the two forms. They were both connected, and this is possibly because Lacey did bring her copy of the rabbit into the abyss with her. So I'm kind of wondering if that was sort of the reason that he was able to travel between the two, because they were technically both exposed to the energies of the abyss. It's just that the one that resided in the abyss longer term was the one that initially housed the consciousness of Oz. And we then find out that he sort of sleeps when Lacey disappears. And when he wakes, he's first sort of awakens to the sound of crying and that he gets the sense from the core of the abyss that it's happy. And we know, of course, that these are the two children that belonged to Lacey. And then, as I guess they grew to a certain point. Alice, black-haired Alice, is ejected from the abyss, and she is sent with one of the rabbits. And then the other one remains in the abyss with the white Alice. Now, it's interesting because 
he basically seems to say that white Alice's ability to sort of inhabit the body of black haired Alice, that she copied him, that he was actually the one who taught her, but that he realizes that it's sort of a different situation because in his case, there isn't a different consciousness, but yet in the Alice's case, there is. And again, I like this sort of, I mean, this whole circular thing that's happening here, right? I mean, Jack, in his own way, says that his existence is thanks to Lacey, that he really had no, you know, desire to exist in the world until he met Lacey. She filled a part of him that was missing. And in this way, we find out that Oz is pretty much the exact same. Oz only exists because of Lacey. Lacey essentially gave him life, helped create his existence. And so then we see Oz split between the two Alices. And it's it's cute because we see a lot of the Alice that is with Oz now in the present. We see a lot of her mannerisms sort of being attributed, like the way she's treating this bunny, right? Like she bites his cheek to wake him up. Um, she's a little bit abusive <laughs> towards him. And yet she loves him so completely and so thoroughly. And we find out that she names him Oz and it is the Levi Glenn who deduces the fact that she's probably on some subconscious level calling him Oz because of Oswald, which was, of course, the brother of Lacey and would go on to become Glenn after Levi. So we now have the origin of Oz's name. We have the origin of Oz himself, of his existence. And then we come to a little bit of tragedy. And it's kind of funny how we have this thing occurring again and again that sometimes good intentions, as wonderful as they may seem, can lead to misery. And that is pretty much what happens in this case. And even Oz, it's funny, he even he is sort of aware and saying to himself, is this where I made my mistake? And effectively what happens is, is that when black-haired Alice meets Jack, the intention of the abyss, the white-haired Alice, she becomes aware and she realizes that it's Jack. And I guess, see, to me, when I take a look at Alice, the two Alices, and you take a look at now that we've sort of known Lacey a little bit, it almost seems like the two Alices are a division of Lacey, right? Because we have Lacey who can be the cruel, cold, kind of mean, very opinionated and strong and everything else. We have that in our black-haired Alice. But yet, in the white Alice, we have that ability Lacey had to be more demure and to assume her proper place and, you know, be a lady of the court, if you will. And so these, it seems almost that these are divided. And of course we have now Oz, who is divided between them, and it creates this nice sort of symmetry, right? This idea that she sent Alice, black-haired Alice, the intention sent her out of the abyss. And she says, I can't leave the abyss. But I wanted her to experience the outside world, and I kind of wanted to see it for myself, and realize that was the only way. But she sends her with the rabbit, too. And I thought that was, I thought that was cool, and I almost wondered if... I didn't know whether that was the intention of it. <laughs> intention. I didn't know whether the intention of it was that she was using that as a way to learn and to create the bridge between the two Alices, or whether it was just purely like an emotional thing that she had had this rabbit and it had meant so much to her, and so she, you know, sent the rabbit out with Alice. But we also know that Alice came out at sort of that early teenage years or what, or I'm not sure how old she's supposed to be, but she's drawn that she looks sort of to be, I think around 12, 13, maybe. And she aged to that age within the abyss. And so it's completely realistic to think that with the two rabbits being there, that it was hers, that it was a playmate for her while she was within the abyss. I'm not too sure. I mean, we really, 
we that's one thing that as much as this, this is the past arc we really weren't told a lot about the actual alice's existence within the abyss and as they grew within the abyss so we're still left in a little bit of a, a mystery as to that but again we have oz who has this sense of dedication and this wanting to thank Lacey because she gave him life. And so when the intention of the abyss picks up on the existence of Jack, she says to Oz, I rescued this from the darkness. It was the last bit of Lacey that I could rescue. And I want you to give it to Jack. And because it was taken from that darkness, it, it actually starts to destroy Oz's physical form in the real world as he transmits it there. And he's able to sort of get Jack's attention and he passes it on and it is a memory of Lacey singing and sort of a little piece of her emotion and her feeling that transmits to Jack. And this seems to be the catalyst for Jack determining that he's going to drop the world that Lacey loved so much into the abyss so that she won't be lonely. And again, this seems to be sort of a misconception of Jack's part, because even though he says to Oswald, or who's Glenn at that point, says to him, he's sort of come to this realization that Lacey will never come again to this world. He still seems to be under this impression that Lacey somehow still exists within the abyss, even though, like I said, the white-haired Alice says, this is all I could save. So it seems fairly apparent that Lacey is, in fact, completely gone. So... We move a little bit further and we find out about sort of the state of the world. And we find out this whole idea of chains is a lot bigger of a concept than what we've been led to believe to this point. I mean, we thought chains were just these creatures that sort of chained you to the abyss and to the power of the abyss. But it turns out that the world itself is sort of held together by chains. The sort of mythical, I can't see it, but it's there all around me, sort of holding the whole world together and keeping the world from dropping into the abyss. Now, I actually found this really interesting. It's just, this is a sidebar and I sort of, I'm sorry if this sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but I, you know, wrote some books and my, it's this concept to me, I was like, oh, I totally get this. And it was this idea that in my books, I called this thing the veil, which was an existence, a space that basically kept realities, kept worlds apart. And that if the veil collapsed, then worlds would collide to each other and destroy them. And this, I'm guessing, is sort of the same idea as what Michizuki is trying to say here, is that the abyss and our physical world are two realities. And even though they are somewhat connected, the simple fact is, is that they aren't really supposed to interact. The abyss, Jack at one point says that chains travel from the abyss to our world through distortions. And we're even told that the children of ill omen, the red air, the red eyed children, that they themselves are distortions. The fact that they're able to open a path to the abyss is a distortion caused by their proximity to a glen. And, so these two realities aren't really supposed to interact with each other. At least that's kind of what I get. Like, I'm still not too sure if the abyss itself is considered to be an afterlife because we know that the abyss has sort of two realities. It has the darkness that has always existed and then it had this realm of light. And Oz, when he's existing in the abyss, says that he sees how the abyss itself is changing and being kind of corrupted. And... So we have these two realities that are kept separate. And effectively what it is, is that you could almost think of, like to me, I guess the way I envision it is, the abyss is like a black hole, right? And in the black hole is what's the abyss. But it's that like sense of gravity. It's that sense of pull. And that our reality has these chains, if you will, that roots it in place so that it can't be dragged blah, 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 into the abyss. Now... Jack, of course, is told this by Levi, and I kind of have to wonder what Levi's whole play in this thing is. Like, we know that Levi died, obviously, like his body literally fell apart. But do you notice, like, he really seems to be playing a lot of chaos. It's almost like, like, if I didn't know better, 
I'd almost say that Levi was just really bitter and pissed at the fact that he had to become Glenn and that it basically spelled his doom because he really just seems to want to F with the system, you know? Like, the whole idea about getting Lacey pregnant so that her child could sort of absorb the abyss and become an actual physical being that they could converse with and have contact with. This whole thing where he's telling Jack, who is obviously distraught and, you know, potentially unstable, telling him like, oh yeah, by the way, do you know that there's chains, chains that hold the world? And what can you do to chains? I mean, Levi doesn't come out right and say it, but, you know, he tells Jack what the outcome would be if those chains were severed and that it is also part of the Baskerville's duty to make sure that those chains aren't severed. And so immediately this puts the idea into Jack's head, right? That, you know, if the chains have to be maintained and protected, that means they can be broken, which means the world can be dragged into the abyss. So to me, it's kind of like this whole Levi guy. To me, it just seems like he was a... He was, I don't know. I don't know what his intention was. I don't know what his idea was about this whole thing, but he really did seem very interested and entertained by the idea of messing with the system and screwing things up and using the people closest to him to continue to do it, even though he knew he probably wouldn't live to see it. So Oz's body in the real world, the, the bat rabbit, it disintegrates and we have... Alice, black-haired Alice, so distraught because this thing is like her best friend. It really is. And we can see where her dislike of Jack is basically born from this event. Like, I wouldn't say that she only hates Jack for that, but definitely this did not help Jack's case for her whatsoever. We then find out that some of the reality that we took for granted is actually, in fact, true. That it was, in fact, Jack who rescued Vincent and Gil off of the streets and sort of helped them out, listened to their story and everything else. But what changes in this is that Jack realizes the, from their story that it sounds very much like they are to be Baskervilles. And so he hands them over to Glenn. And so that's where the story sort of changes. So it's kind of interesting to me, too. It's that whole the best lies are ones that are based on the truth, right? So the whole idea that Gil was his valet is a lie, but it isn't a lie that Jack was held in very high esteem by both Gil and Vincent and because he was, in fact, the one who rescued them and showed them kindness. And this may partly be because of the whole thing that Lacey had red eyes, and, I mean, he does mention that he notices that Vincent has a red eye like Lacey, and that later on he says that it really reminds him, seeing Gil and Vincent together, it reminds him of Oswald and Lacey. So, again, it's this connection, right? And that it's almost, it's kind of self-serving. Like, again, you see with Jack that even with these two boys... I don't think he's just rescuing them out of the kindness of his heart. It's because, again, it's that kind of grasping at something like Lacey. It, it is the trying to rescue something that was like Lacey because he couldn't rescue Lacey. I kind of think that, that it's a very self-serving, almost selfish kind of thing. To me, at least that's how I interpret it. I don't think it was just purely altruistic, like, oh, I'm going to save these two kids. I really do think that... Him mentioning he sees Lacey and Oswald in them is really what drove him into action in the first place. And perhaps if he hadn't lost Lacey, he wouldn't have helped the kids. I don't know. I mean, we'll never know, right? But in any case, we now find that we have Glenn as and with as the taking Gil on as his valet, and we already know that that pretty much means that Gil's going to be his successor. And then we have Vincent and. We pretty much know at this point that Vincent's going to have to be thrown into the abyss. I mean, this seems to be this, you know, practice, right? And it got me thinking because we have the old crone in the Baskervilles. And we know that she basically brainwashed Gil 
into this idea that he has to save his master. He has to protect his master. It doesn't matter who threatens his master, he must destroy them. And I kind of wonder if this same thing was done to Oswald. And if this is why, even though, you know, he expressed some misgivings, he still in the end sacrificed Lacey because he was convinced and taught that she was a threat to his master, to Glenn, to the existence of Glenn. So is this brainwashing really just to make these kids great valets? Or is it essentially to brainwash them to the point where they'll even kill a relative or a loved one just because they're seen as an abomination or a threat or what have you? Which to me (laughs) kind of makes it a little bit more twisted and sick in a way. But we have Jack now. He's putting together a plan, right? Because now Jack is set on this idea that he wants to deliver the world to Lacey in the Abyss. If she can't leave the Abyss, then the Abyss will have the world that she so loved. And it's interesting because we have him now sort of coordinating with the intention of the Abyss when she inhabits Alice. And he's basically saying to her, I want you to use your power to sever those chains. And this is the first time that we actually see the core of the Abyss come forward. And it's interesting because the core of the Abyss seems to be very benevolent. It does not want... It says she can't do it. If it does, it'll destroy her. And my being within her is already causing problems. And I don't want to hurt her anymore. And I thought that was really interesting that... You have the intention of the Abyss, who is seen as this almost sadistic figure, this figure that sends these chains out into the world that causes misery and everything else, but yet the core that exists within her very much has regret that it's caused any kind of pain. And I don't know if that's because that is the core of the Abyss, and maybe that's why the Abyss was a more golden place in the past or whether it's because it's almost taken on a parental view because it basically raised these children from their infancy so in any case jack says well if she can't do it then give me a chain that can and this is where oz's sort of tragic tale begins because It seems pretty straightforward that if you're going to turn something into a chain, if you're going to create a chain, what are you going to use? And to her, it's obvious. I'm going to use the thing that has been in the abyss just as long, if not longer, than I have, that's lived at the very core, the very heart of the abyss, and has probably absorbed more of the abyss's energy in all of its forms than any other thing within the abyss. And so she uses the stuffed bunny to become the bee rabbit and gives it to Jack as a way of the bee, of severing the chains that hold our world. Which brings us to Sablier. Now, we know that Jack is colluding with Miranda Barma and that he's using her, obviously, to try and accomplish his own goals. And Miranda is, she is out there. She wants Oswald's head because she wants to chop it off, watch his body decay, and then have his skull with her forever. Yeah, she's she's kind of messed up. But it's clear that Jack is kind of using her now. And I know when I said in the last video, I kind of wondered how much input Miranda had into this, because to me it seemed like her magical abilities sort of would compensate for areas where Jack is weak. But I see now that really what this boils down to is Jack is just a master manipulator. And he's manipulated the intention of the Abyss to give him this chain, and he's manipulating Miranda in order to give him the ability to obtain the chain. Because he's told basically that this chain being so powerful and so unique, it can't escape through the normal distortions of the abyss between the abyss and our world. Basically, it can only come out of a gate. And so they put together this plan, he and Miranda, 
that they're going to use Vincent in order to get him to open the gate. Because we know now that the children of ill omen, that is what they can do, right? They can interfere with the abyss, interact with the abyss in a similar manner to Glenn. And so now we find out that Vincent has harbored this hatred towards Alice for so long because of how she spoke to him and because of what she said was going to happen to Gil. And we find out that it wasn't even black-haired Alice. It was actually the intention, the white Alice, that was inhabiting her body and telling him these things and doing these things to him because of Jack. Because Jack is like, you need to tell him this. And of course, Vincent would believe her. She's been there the whole time he has, if not longer. And again, because she is different, she is treated in a way that's different from the rest of the Baskervilles. So again, she is seen as a figure by him that would tell the truth. Well, she sets him off. And then Miranda tells him how to open the door. And Jack uses him to obtain the bee rabbit. And he also, Jack, side note, Jack says that when Lacey used her chain, he thought he saw the outline or, you know, an image of a rabbit behind her. And so he's like, you know, I'm really happy to have a chain that's like Lacey's. And I kind of wonder if that's why she chose like stuffed bunnies to give to the abyss because she had a, a rabbit chain. But I don't know if there's anything going to be sort of deeper to that connection. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I almost, I mean, I almost wonder as I'm sitting here talking about this, I almost wonder if that's kind of the thing. Like if Lacey was taken into the abyss, she still would have had her chain with her, at least as, as I would think so. So was that partly what, you know, partly what went into Oz was the fact that her chain was absorbed into the abyss? Was that something that the intention of the abyss saved? Or is it just that the intention of the abyss remembered the rabbit and it was immediately sort of a, that was why she used Oz, aside from the obvious reason that he'd been there so long. So we have our present day where of course adults Vince and Gill are being told this by Barma who's finally said like we're getting the idea now that Barma wanted to confirm all of this for himself because he realized that Duke Barma's diary was a forgery well it wasn't a forgery per se but that he was basically forced by Jack to write the events the way that Jack wanted them to but that the Duke then used ciphers and you know and puzzles and stuff within the book in order to write the true events of what happened. And it was really interesting to see like Vince be so upset that he had been manipulated by Jack. And you realize that this whole time he's still harbored these very positive feelings for Jack for having saved them. And it's really sad. Like this, you know, this whole like two volumes that we're getting they're so filled with this sort of tragedy and sacrifices and people feeling like a part of them has been torn away because of who they've lost and their whole identity being questioned because of the actions of another person and so we finally come to Sablier where now Jack has the bee rabbit and he's chosen this moment because this is where Glenn was going to pass Raven on to Gill. And it was the one time that there wouldn't be Baskerville guards posted at the gate of the abyss. Instead, it was going to be the night rays, which here we go. This is where the night rays now, it figures that they're with the Baskervilles this long, right? So Jack, Miranda gives Jack a way to basically knock these guards out and that's how he gets access. And so that's why he chooses that specific moment. And that's why there's all these people in Sablier because they're there to see this, you know, event, right? The beginning of the next volume in the Baskerville history. And so now, of course, Jack gets the bee rabbit and he uses it to sever the world's chains. Now, 
this is why we finally get an answer to how could Glenn not be a villain and yet order the Baskervilles to murder all those people? The reason being, we find out, is that it's almost like mercy killings, basically. He's like, you know what? There's no way, with the energy that's been released, I can use my chains to basically reinforce the world's chains. But I have to drag all of that energy, all of that energy that's threatening to unlo- to loose all the chains around the world. I'm going to pull it into Sablier, and then Sablier itself will be pulled into the abyss. And he says, you know what? We need to kill all of the humans here because if they don't get killed, they'll be dragged into the abyss and either become chains or be lost in the abyss forever. And their cycle of a hundred years, they will never be able to be reborn. And so essentially what he's trying to do is save their immortal souls. And which I, I was like, wow, okay, yeah, I did not, I honestly, I did not see that coming. And maybe I should have, but you know, at the same time that they, I guess the thing is, is that so much stuff happens in this series that when they were talking about the whole hundred cycles thing, I think a part of me almost thought that it only applied to Glenn. I, I don't, I don't know if I quite made the connection that that was just souls in general. But in any case, we have this point now where Glenn is like, we need to save these people's immortal souls. You need to kill them before Sablier is dragged into the abyss. And then we have Glenn facing off against Jack, of course. And we know that Gil is injured, that Jack is the one who cuts him down. And... It seems pretty clear that Jack killed Glenn, but the thing that I don't quite understand still is how did they get Glenn's body to create the seals? Now, the only thing I can think of is that Jack dragged Glenn's corpse out of there, but that's not stated either in this. And so, obviously, he faces off against Glenn, he survives the battle, and he goes to see Alice and he's like, I need the intent. And he starts calling out to the intention to come forward into Alice. And I really, really liked this. Like, okay. I mean, I don't like what ends up happening, but I loved the sadness and the devotion that Alice still has to Oz where she's like, what did you do to him? He's screaming in pain. And We realize that, you know, Oz really doesn't want to be this destroyer. He doesn't want to hurt people. He is intent, he is being used and manipulated by what the intention has done to him and by his contract with Jack. And so Alice is, black haired Alice is like, no, I'm not going to help you make Oz do anything more. No. And she ends up killing herself to prevent the intention from coming forward to try and do anything about, you know, making Oz repowered or whatever it is to try and overcome Glenn's chains. So she kills herself. And I was like, man, to take scissors to your own throat. And like, you can see now where there's that incredible devotion to Oz that she really did love him as a living thing and that we now understand why throughout our previous volumes now, whenever she has been so upset or, you know, frightened by Oz getting stronger and starting to use his powers and all this kind of stuff and why she constantly stops him, it's because she knows him and she knows that deep down this isn't who he is or what he wants to be. So then we come back to our modern day, because at this point, I mean, there's really not much more to say about Sablier. I mean, obviously, yes, I wonder, how did Jack get out? And did he drag Glenn's body out? Because like I said, clearly they got Glenn's body somehow. So Sablier, of course, then is, we now know, of course, why it dropped into the abyss. So we come out to our modern day, and Jack, of course, is still controlling Oz's body, controlling the powers of the bee rabbit, and he breaks the world chains again. 
He says that he's not as strong, so it will take time. But it's done. It's going to happen. And then we have Gil trying to find Oz because, of course, he's very confused. And Brake goes after him to try and stop him because Brake realizes that if Gil now acknowledges Glenn as his master, that actually Oz is in a hell of a lot of trouble and a lot of danger if Gil comes close to him. And, of course, he's proven absolutely right because as soon as Gil arrives... Leo slash Glenn orders Gil to shoot Oz and he does it without hesitation. And we can see the shock on his face, but it doesn't change the fact that that programming is still there. And I think that I don't judge Gil for this at this point, because I think that if Gil had been of his right mind, he may have been able to fight that. But we have to recall like what kind of emotional shock he's now just had like I mean this isn't just shock this is like emotional trauma he is not in his own mind like he is out of his mind almost literally and so for him to try and fight that programming you know it's it's almost impossible which so I don't I don't read this as being weakness in Gil I don't read this that you know his relationship with Oz didn't mean much or that he didn't think of highly of Oz as he did Glenn or Leo or what have you. To me, this is just a man who is so damaged he doesn't have the defenses to fight back. So I don't judge Gil harshly for this. But we don't have answers about a few things still. And I mean... Now we understand, like, why Sablier happened. We understand Jack's motivation for making it happen. We now know that Glenn killing those people wasn't a villainous move. In fact, he was trying to save them in his own way, or at least the only way that he possibly could. But the only things that I don't quite understand... So, Glenn sent his chains to prevent the destruction of the world. Is that why his chains were still... I'm guessing that's why his chains were still in the world when Sablier was sucked in. Like, they didn't go with him because he had sent them out, right? Plus, he died, which would mean the chain would be severed. And he died without having a successor. So I guess this is that probably answers that. Although I find it interesting that they would just revert back to the different doors that the different dukedoms held. And I still kind of wonder how it is those doors exist or why they exist or like, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I, part of me wonders if the doors were just where they were and that as they were investigating after Sablier, because now there were no Baskervilles to kind of prevent them from doing so, they found these doors and then built their own sort of dukedoms and their own, you know, homes or palaces or castles or whatever you want to call them around these doors. Yeah, I'm still not too sure how that whole power structure of the dukedoms works. I mean, we know that the night rays were disgraced, but I think the night rays were disgraced because of Jack. Again, this is him rewriting history because now he has this power, right? So he makes basically Vesalius become this really powerful house. He allies himself with Barma because of his relationship with Miranda. And then, and basically, I guess, holds a whole bunch of crap over Duke Barma's head to keep him in line. And they write off the Night Rays as basically being villains that were involved in Sablier. And then we have the Rainsworths who, I don't know what, I, I don't know, we don't really know a lot about the Rainsworths and how they sort of elevated themselves. I mean, perhaps they were a very noble and well-regarded family before all this happened. And it was really just House Vesalius that sort of renegotiated its power. And the reason that they went after Night Ray was because of Night Ray's allegiance to the Baskervilles. And perhaps Jack saw them as a threat of, you know, trying to bring back the Baskervilles or that they may somehow work against him. So we still don't know quite all that. We certainly don't know how a black rabbit chain becomes a little baby boy who grows up to be 
our current Oz. We don't know how that happened. We don't really know what happened to Miranda Barma after all of these events. I'd almost be tempted to say that Jack killed her because, because it just doesn't seem to me like Jack leaves a lot of loose ends. I mean, if he's obviously manipulated Duke Barma to leave a document behind that Jack figures will be found that will exonerate Jack and say, yes, he was the hero and everything else, and will cast the Night Rays and the Baskervilles as villains. So, I mean, obviously he's thinking ahead. He is. And we know that he thought ahead because when he delivered that seal to the magician's, you know, predecessors, he told them, the bee, person who holds the bee rabbit's power is the one that you should allow into here, is the one that you should acknowledge for the seal. So he was thinking long game, obviously. And I don't know how exactly he knew that. Like, I, I, this is where I kind of wonder if maybe Miranda's knowledge, again, he used her for her knowledge. Maybe he and Miranda somehow set something up that Oz would be a vessel that somehow would Jack could sort of piggyback back into reality. I'm not this, like I said, that that's completely not discussed and I'm guessing we're going to get there most obviously, but we got to get to the future volumes first. So that's where I'm going to end this video. There was lots to talk about the, you know, still a lot of unanswered questions, but certainly we have a lot firmer understanding of what happened in the past it's now just the events of the past sort of 15 years or whatever that we're still sketchy on exactly what occurred that brought Oz to become you know what he is and everything like those are the things that we'll still need to have answered and we still don't even know black-haired Alice you know our who thought she was the bee rabbit we still don't know sort of how she is. Again, in this volume, she begins to go transparent. And this time she notices it herself because she goes to tackle Oz and goes like right through him. So I still kind of am subscribing to the idea that our Alice, our, that we thought was B Rabbit, that she is something that somehow Oz conjured. But again, I'm really not sure yet. I don't know. I, I'm not sure if maybe somehow she's a chain. Like, can a chain have a chain? I, I don't know. <laughs> but we're going to find out in future volumes. So I've talked for a lot longer in this video than any of the other ones because there was so much to talk about and they're probably only going to get longer because we're only, what, like six volumes or whatever from the very end of this series. So everything's probably going to run hard and fast from here on to the end. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are new here, don't forget to subscribe so you can watch all of my future Pandora Hearts videos. Plus, I'm going to be doing this same sort of series with a new series once we finish Pandora Hearts. I do other manga reviews as well as light novel reviews. And I don't just read books. I like to write them too. I've got links to those as well. So thanks very much for watching this big honking video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Until then, bye-bye for now.